Our scripture today comes from Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let your, down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Peter, we, or Master, we have worked all night long but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down my nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Like I mentioned, we are, over the next four weeks, we're going to delve into the four verbs in our new mission statement. Love, feed, affirm, welcome. These are the actions that we, and explicitly one of them, Jesus, takes um, to form our community and therefore the work that we do in response to the call that God has given us. And we are going to, like I said, save love for a couple weeks from now and start with this word fed. What does it mean to be fed, to feed, to, to deal with both physical and spiritual food? And in some ways it makes sense that this would be the first word that we would reflect on together as a community, as feeding people has been at our core from the very beginning. From that first meeting in the Goodwill building where I hear Kathy and Norm had to like truck in chili, was it, or something like that? Chili and all the fixins, right, that you know Kathy like slaved for year, days over, right, ahead of time. We have always prioritized uh, making sure that the spiritual nourishment people feel when they come here is paired with physical nourishment. And that took on additional meaning when we started the table, knowing that being a place where physical needs are met meant giving people the liberation, the space, the freedom to also have their spiritual needs met. And I think that's one of the m many reasons why these last two years have been really hard for this community in particular. Because we couldn't physically share a table, because we're still not able to gather around a meal on Sunday mornings, I think it can feel like the center has dropped out, right? Like, and it has in like any number of ways, but here in this community, right, it, it feels like something is missing. And it can be hard to imagine doing things without that center Right? Perhaps that's why there were, I don't know if anyone else besides pastors noticed this, uh, but competing articles around virtual worship came out uh, this week. One in the New York Times, one in Sojourners Magazine, one saying, oh, we should drop it. And the other said, one said, no, we should keep it. And, and once again, it felt like two years ago where I was like, oh my gosh, we need to stop talking about this, right? We know that we simply can't go back to the way things were, right? Because even as Omicron is on the decline and vaccines for little ones are on the horizon, I'm planning a dance party if you have a kid under five. <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> as soon as they are all vaccinated, they are getting in this building and dancing their little heart, socially awkward hearts out. Um, but even as like hope is on the horizon, we still have no idea of like what is actually to come. And so I think we're feeling a little bit like we're just out here with broken and empty nets and are just sitting on the shore. That's why I was glad for this story today. 
This is how Luke tells the story of the calling of the first disciples. And frankly, it's a much more relatable and coherent version than how Matthew and Mark tell it, right? You probably are familiar with that telling of the story, right? Um, it is often like Jesus is, if you see it visually, like in a Christian movie, right, where Jesus is walking down the beach and like the wind's blowing his usually blonde hair and <laughs> and he's just like really ethereal, right? And and the guys are at their boats and all Jesus has to do is say, come, follow me. And they just like magically like drop everything and go. Yeah, that's, we talked about that version at our leadership retreat last weekend and universally said, I would have a whole lot of follow-up questions, right? <laughs> and um, so we don't think that's how it actually happens. And so maybe that's why Luke, who is writing several decades after Mark and maybe around the same time as Matthew, maybe Matthew's a little earlier, um, but maybe Luke writes and feels the need to add some context around the story because maybe even in those very early days, people were like, that is not how any of this works. Excuse me. So um, Luke adds some meat to the story. Jesus was there on the beach, yes, but not wandering around. He was teaching, already famous enough to draw a crowd of people so massive, the only way he could address them was from a boat out on the lake. And while it's pretty clear Peter and the lot weren't there specifically to hear them, it's almost as if like that just happened to be where they were fishing that day. In the chapter before, Jesus has already healed Peter's mother-in-law. So however you feel about mother-in-laws, that's pretty impressive. And so maybe he just happened to be around there that day. And they have, but they have some context of knowing who Jesus is for when he suddenly commissions their boat. And that's the other way Luke's telling of the story varies from that simpler tale. Jesus doesn't just say, follow me and magically it happens. He meets the fishermen where they are at and proves that he is worth following before he even makes the act. Not only does he teach in their boat, and we don't know the content of that teaching, but it's probably pretty Jesus-y, I would imagine. <laughs> and so, so he teaches and then he says, go out and put your nets on the other side. And I love Peter's response because it is way more faithful and more grace-filled than I would be. I would probably say something like, listen, carpenter man, I am a professional. <laughs> and I am telling you there are no fish out there, so I am not going to put my heavy nets back into the boat and then go out onto the like, deep water just because like, some buckler and spiritual man has a hunch, right? Like, I'm not doing that. I say that to Jesus a lot, um, <laughs> right? But in this moment, Peter is way better than I am and shrugs and says, all right, if you say so, why not? We'll try it. <laughs> Even before the big catch of fish, there is something so beautiful about that response. There's something open about it. How many times have you been a part of a group of people, let's call it a church, um, where someone has a new idea and then someone says, oh, we tried that 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah, we tried that 10 years ago and it didn't work. Um, right? That's so frustrating. It's one of my pet peeve statements, right? It's right up there with, oh, well, you've always done it that way. <laughs> and like when someone, right, the two the seemingly opposite uh, statements and yet the same root of shutting down the possibility that God might be up to something new. Peter's response is open to whatever might happen. Sure, yeah, we've tried it before, but sure, if you say so, Jesus, we can try again. It gives space to be surprised in spite of his past experience. And when he does that, he ropes in more fish than I think he has maybe ever seen in a single catch Enough fish to not only give his family and his partner's family sustenance, but enough to sell and have some like little bit of lasting sustainability 
He's fed not only in fish for the day, but in food for time to come. And, and he is fed and filled with hope and wonder. It is only then that Jesus invites him into a life of discipleship, of catching people. And then it makes at least a little more sense that he would drop everything to follow. Jesus has proven worthy of their trust and their hope, meeting both their physical and their spiritual needs. Which is, I think, the message everyone needs to hear, especially going on two years into a pandemic. That even while we are exhausted from mending our nets, even when we think there is no possible way anything good from trying something old or something new to come about, God instead is intending something abundant and unexpected. All we need to do is to be open and do things we think might be hard. I was um, privileged this past week to be asked to help with the Cats Business School's Super Analytics Challenge, and I'm not like fully aware of what all those words mean in <laughs> the right context, right? It's the Business School at Pitt. They started this program last year. It's the program that connected us with Love Beyond Walls for our sink, our hand-washing sink. Um, what they do is they take graduate students um, from a variety of disciplines at Pitt and focus them in on a social issue um, to come up with creative responses. Um, the, the thinking being, right, if you put Pittsburgh's best and brightest together and, and show them a problem, like maybe they'll come up with something new and different. Um, and like I said last year, they saw the need for um, hygiene in the homeless community and connected us with Love Beyond Walls. This year's challenge is focused on food insecurity and working with the Greater Pittsburgh Food Bank. And so I was asked to be on a panel of experts. <laughs> that was great. Um, <laughs> that included right, people who do resource mapping, um, who uh, 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 Feeding America, Feed America, something like that, the National Food Bank System, a giant eagle rep was there. And for better or worse, I was the person representing people who do things on the ground, like actually with people. Um, so, sorry students, <laughs> they get, just get our little view of what feeding people looks like. Um, but they had us as a panel of experts, they had like actual business analytics people earlier. I was not a part of that conversation. Um, but they took all of those conversations, the data, the other research that they're doing into consideration and now their task is over the next few weeks to think both analytically and creatively about new ways of meeting the challenge of food insecurity here in Pittsburgh. And I have no idea what they're gonna come up with. I don't know if it'll have to do with our site specifically or like citywide or even bigger, I don't know. Um, but I think the model, as I was like participating in those conversations and thinking about this text, the model is maybe one way that Christ is inviting us to go into the deeper water and try the other side, right? We're not hanging out on a beach, so Jesus can't come with his flowing hair. Um, maybe, I think. Um, but I think God is, works best to open us up to experiencing new ideas and abundance when instead of just like mourning and mending our nets, we enter into a time of collective discernment and knowledge and hopes and passions and bring those all together individually for something bigger and better. That's when we reap in unexpected grace and abundance. That's when we are fed physically and spiritually by having our hearts and minds ready to say, well, if you say so, Lord, I guess I'll try it. So we're going to have a little bit of time for reflection with a song. But when we break into small groups, if you want to, I'd like to think, keep thinking about how we as a community feed one another and feed others. Um, so what I want you to do is to think about the best meal that you have had. Don't die, Wiley. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> I want you to think about the best meal that you have had in the last two years, in the pandemic. Oh, the best meal. 
And you can define best however you want to, right? Quality of food, um, uh, right? The company, the first time you ate out after lockdown, the pizza party you had when you were in lockdown, like with just your family, whatever you have. I want us to have a conversation about how you experienced abundance and nourishment in a time that felt empty, when perhaps your nets were filled when you really did not expect them to be. Um, and maybe in thinking about what made those times special, that can spark something in us as we think about what God is calling us to do. How can we create a space here where we feed people um, that can also help us help people experience that same feeling. So as we do that, may we be as faithful and trusting as Simon Peter of whatever God is going to call us to. Amen.